this morning. I was going to read you lyrics um, to one of my favorite songs. But I'll say it's one of my favorite melancholy songs. <laughs> Only because uh, I don't, I'm not usually one to enjoy a melancholy song, um, but it's a very thoughtful song. And I thought, you know, it's a, a great way to um, just set the stage for some, some thoughtfulness and time with God this morning as we worship Him. Um, again, the, the song is just beautiful, and so I'm glad you get to hear it. Um, but uh, more importantly are the words. So some of you may want to even just close your eyes and get rid of distractions, don't fall asleep. Um, haven't even started yet, so that's not allowed. Uh, but just, just think about the words to this song and, um, and what, they, what they mean for us today, what they mean for you today. What if the trials of this life are his mercies in disguise? That's sometimes a tough pill to swallow. Blessings, blessings. What if the blessings come through raindrops? What if our blessings come through tears? And then, of course, it ends with this thought. This world is not our home. This world is not our home. What better place um, to look in the Bible than the book of Revelation? When you think about this world not being our home, the thing we think about is, well, when do we get to go home? When is this finally over? And we think about Revelation, I don't know that many of us think about blessings. I don't know that many of us think about blessings when we think about the book of Revelation. But we actually find there are seven blessings in Revelation, specific ones that we're going to look at this morning. Do you know that the, the number seven is used in Revelation a lot? Um, you know, it, if you really look hard and you pull things together, some people have come up with 49 different groups of sevens. But there's at least 25 different groups that are specifically separate from each other. You know, the, the ones that come to mind, you know, you think of the seven churches, the seven candlesticks, the seven seals, the seven bowls. You know, those are the ones that are, that are common. But if you, it's, it's interesting. Even if you just Google it, you'll just see these different lists that people have compiled, these groups of seven. Now, what is seven in the Bible? What is that significant for? What is it? Perfection or, or, or completion or this, this idea of, of, of that, that something will be completed, something is important, that we should listen up and take, um, take note, right? So this morning, I want to share with you seven of the blessings in Revelation. We'll unpack them a little bit, but these are them right here. Um, I just put them all in one page here so we could just get an overview. He who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things that are written in it. Blessed is he, right? That reads or hears the words of the prophecy, okay? That's one of the blessings. The next one is the dead who die in the Lord. Blessed is he who dies in the Lord during the time of what? Tribulation. That's in Revelation 14, 13. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. Revelation 16, 15. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed is he who has part in the first resurrection. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who do his what? 
his commandments. We're going to unpack those a little bit this morning. I just wanted to give you this overview of Revelation. Um, we've been able to, to, to really go through Revelation. Um, we're, we still haven't finished Revelation. We started almost two years ago in Wairika. So um, we're still studying Revelation. And the beauty of Revelation is that it's so multifaceted. You get so many different ideas and concepts, but the one that we've been tracing in Wairika, and the one that I want to trace through with you is one that not necess- we don't necessarily focus on a lot. Uh, you know, of course, our church is known for doing Revelation seminars, Daniel and Revelation series, and we focus a lot on the prophecies and what's going to happen and, and um, <clears throat> kind of a timeline of things that are going to happen. Of course, we don't know the day or the hour, but this is what's going to happen, and it's going to lead up to the end, Right? But rather than looking at specifically the prophecies, of course, we'll cover those as well, um, but I'm trying to give you an overview of Revelation because oftentimes we get a little bit bogged down in, should I say, fear or trepidation or worry, whatever you want to call it. We start looking at all these prophecies and we think, wow, it's going to get really bad. But is that the message of Revelation? Is it truly the message of Revelation? Was God's goal to give us more worry or or fear in this life? I don't think so. I think he wants to give us an awareness. And I also think he wants to give us a security, not security in, in ourselves, but security in his righteousness, security in his blood that was shed for humankind. And so when we look at Revelation, (coughs) excuse me, When we look at Revelation, I want you to look at Revelation a little bit differently. What is Revelation? A lot of times we just say Revelation, but did you know that the book is, the title of the book, if you look at the the complete title, it's The Revelation of Something, Ah, of someone, of Jesus Christ. So if it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, it might include a timeline. It might include some kingdoms and, and, and things that will take place. But it's a revelation of who? Jesus Christ. So why is he giving us all these details that, yes, maybe they, they cause fear or worry or anxiety or, or whatever? Is that his goal? No, it's not. We already said that. So what is the purpose of this timeline? The purpose is actually to make us aware. Do you see, you know, somebody said the, the definition of fear is the unknown. So here we have in Revelation that Jesus is making known what is going to happen so that we do not, what? Fear. Fear doesn't get you anywhere. There is a healthy fear that Jesus talked about, Right? He said, don't fear those who can kill the body, but fear the one that can what? That can kill the soul. Now, who's the only one that has the ability to do that? God. So there should be a healthy fear of God as our judge. There is going to be an end to all of this. Even when you think of Revelation, yes, there's going to be a lot of bad things that happen, but even the end of many lives, those who have not chosen to be a part of the kingdom of God, even that is God's mercies in disguise, like we heard in this song. That is God's mercy in disguise. You, you wouldn't think of God as, as um, and, and he even says, I'm not willing that any should what? Perish, but that all should what? Come to repentance. That's his goal. But even in his mercy, he has to destroy sin and those who do not depart from it. Blessed is he who reads, hears, and keeps the word of God. So there are many different people who get to experience this blessing. You can get the blessing just by reading through Revelation. Better yet, study Revelation. And even better still would be to study Revelation in light of other books of the Bible. But there is a blessing that we are promised, Revelation 1.3 says. So there is a blessing just by you being here this morning. I'm studying uh, Revelation. 
I'm bringing you some of the things that I've been studying. You're interacting with it this morning, and there is a blessing in that. Blessed is he who reads, hears, and then what? Keeps the word. The definition of listen is to take notice and that that taking notice will bring someone to action, right? So listening, responding to advice or requests. The next one is blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Boy, isn't that true? Blessed are those who die in the Lord. Apothneskontes. Maybe Pastor Hess could outdo me on that one, but apothneskontes. Sometimes it takes a little bit to, uh, to remember those Greek words, doesn't it? Especially the long ones. So those who die, those who are presently dying is what it's talking about here. And presently dying, what, at Revelation 14, when, what time is this taking place? So, so those that are dying during the last persecution of God's people. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. So this will be those who are martyrs living during a special time. They will have a special blessing. This will be a unique time of incomparable Christian persecution coming upon the earth. But again, even in light of knowing that that persecution will come, God is right there. He's reassuring us. He's like, but there's going to be a special blessing for those people that have to live or die during that time. The victory of the saints will not be an be in influencing the social institutions of the globe towards service of God. As lofty a goal as that might be, it will be found in their cleaving to the lamb through thick and thin, in living and in dying. Amen? Those who cling to the lamb. The next one is, blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. This one's come up a few times in my recent sermons. He who watches, or ho gregorion, gregoron. It's a present tense participle, the one presently or continually watching. So that's, we don't quite get that translated into the English, do we? Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. It's, It's the one who is and will be and will continue to be watching and keeping his garments clean. He is blessed because his nakedness is not seen in his watchfulness. He evidences true what? Faith. Faith. Keeping your garments refers to the avoidance of sinful behavior and continuing in faith with confession in the event that we do sin. We are ever mindful of when we do make a mistake. We are watching uh, we were talking about in Sabbath school this morning, girding up our, the loins of our what? Our minds, that we are preparing for the battle ahead. That's the, the special blessing that we are promised in Revelation 16, 15. So blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Some of the, uh, some of the scariest Thankfully, there are dreams that I think people have experienced. Maybe you've experienced those, but it's where you are not properly clothed when in public. That's not a good feeling, is it? But how much worse will this feeling be when Jesus comes if we are not properly clothed? To know that we had the opportunity to be clothed. But thank God we are clothed, aren't we? That's why we're here this morning. Lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Shame is, I'm not even going to try that one. Um, so this, you can see this Greek word here, it means for spiritual unpreparedness. That's what that walking naked means, spiritually unprepared. Christ told the lukewarm church of Laodicea, you remember this one, buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Is God willing that we are naked when he comes? He wants us to be clothed, doesn't he? With whose garments? The garments that he has given us, his robes of righteousness, and they are to be washed in the what? In the blood of the lamb. This speaks to the internal reality of a person's walk being exposed for all to see. So there will be a time of judgment, won't there? Blessed is he 
who watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. The next one we find is, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, how many are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb? So what would this being called mean? For those who respond, isn't it? The Lamb is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, as we see in Revelation 5. Jesus Christ, who prevailed to open the scroll with the seven seals. He was the only one that was able to open the seal, right? In our studies previously to, to now. So those that are called, kekle menoi, kekle menoi. It's a perfect passive participle. Notice all these perfect passive participles going on here. While having been called. So it's something that, that is a continual call. Continual call. God is continually calling you where? To his marriage supper. He wants to be in union with you. When you think of um, those that are called in the past and they now stand as invited guests, you know, um, it's God's call on us. Remember, think about the, the man on the cross. When was he called? Right then and there, the last moments of his life. Reminds us of the story of, of um, uh, I was just teaching the, the kids in Bible class, um, or no, this was, uh, sorry, this was for chapel. And I was sharing with them that, uh, that parable where this man needs workers for his farm or his ranch or what have you, and he goes into town and he says, uh, in the morning, you know, eight o'clock, whatever it was, and he says, I need you to come work for me. I'm gonna give you a day's wages. Then he goes back a few hours later. Hey, I still need more workers. Found another guy. I'll give you a day's wages. Goes at noon, finds, you know, and he keeps doing this throughout the day. He goes out, it sounds like, according to the Bible, about five o'clock at night. Now, how much work are you gonna get done after that? Probably not very much. He says, I'm gonna give you a day's wages. And then he starts going through and he gives the last person that showed up their day's wages. He gives them a dollar. And then the next one that came at, uh, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon, he gives them a dollar. So pretty soon these other guys are thinking, wow, this is great. I've been here since eight o'clock this morning. I'm gonna get a lot of money. And so then he comes to the guy at noontime. And he gives him a dollar. And then the guy at 10, and he gives him a dollar. And this guy, and the guy that came at 80 is thinking, this is just not fair. How come they get all this money, and I'm getting a dollar too? I've been here all day long. You see, that's not how it is in heaven. Things don't work out the same way as they do on earth, do they? In heaven, we rejoice with those that are saved, whether they're saved as, as being a child and they enter that saving relationship with God throughout their whole life or whether it's that thief on the cross. Those who are being called. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The next one is Revelation 20, verse six. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Okay. Oh, there it is. All right. Wonderful. All right. They are blessed because they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. This blessing is equivalent to the blessing for those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb that we just looked at in Revelation 19.9 because they are welcomed into the kingdom of God. Isn't that what we're looking forward to, friends? The blessing of being welcomed into the kingdom of God? Absolutely. These are Holy, hagios, because they are the saints. They have washed their robes where? And made them white in the blood of the lamb. So blessed are those, uh, I'm sorry, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Why? Over such the second death has no power. 
You see, Christ promised the overcomer of the church at Smyrna, Revelation 2, the persecuted church, which experienced martyrdom, that they would not be hurt by the what? The second death. They would be a part of the first resurrection at the second coming, and the second death would have no power over them. This is what we comfort each other with, isn't it? Like in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, says that, that uh, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we all ever be with the Lord. Okay? So that's a promise, isn't it? And at the end of that promise, it says, comfort one another with these words. So the blessing of being a part of the first resurrection is that we may die this temporary death. But that's why Jesus called it a what? A sleep. Because he says, this isn't the end of your life when you are in Christ. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive will be caught up to meet him in the air. So the second death will have no power over them. The second death is the destiny of those who are not written in the book of life. So look at what Revelation 20 verse 14 says. Then death and Hades were cast into what? The lake of fire. So it sounds like even death and hell are going to be destroyed at that time, right? And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is not an ever-burning, ever-torturing fire. This is a fire that has eternal consequences. No one will ever rise from those flames. They will quench what they are burning. The second death, oh, I'm sorry. And then um, Revelation 21 verse 8 says, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the what? The second death. So if you haven't studied the first and second death, what I'm hoping to leave you with this morning is that there is a difference. The first death is that one that we will all die unless Jesus comes before we die. Okay, that's the first death. The second death is what Jesus experienced on the cross. He experienced separation from God. Do you remember what he said on the cross? His final words, what was it? Eloi, Eloi, laba sabachthani. What was he saying? Those that didn't understand his uh, language were like, well, what is, he, what is he saying? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know that Jesus on the cross was feeling naked? He was feeling exposed. Not only was he naked, but he was feeling exposed. He had the weight of sin upon himself. He had your sin. Not because he had to, but because he wanted to. He wanted to bear your sins so that you could be free to live eternally with he and everyone else that has been washed in the blood of the Lamb could be in heaven with each other. Blessed is he, Revelation 22, verse 7, the next one. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. He who keeps is ho teron, present participle. The one, now catch this, it's a present participle. The one continually watching over and guarding. You've all, this is a text you've all heard. Satan prowls around like a what? A roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But friends, if you know a lion's coming around, what are you going to be doing? I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm at least getting in my car, if not running into my house, making sure I shut the door behind me and not leaving it open in my haste. So, you know, there's, there's this, this place of security. You know, Tessa has her places of security. She wants to be at home to sleep or she wants to be in her car seat. And then she just, boy, can't get her to sleep, put her in her car seat, start driving down the road. Five minutes later, she's gone. She feels safe. She feels secure. That's how God wants us to feel with him. He wants us to feel safe and secure. We don't have to worry about the lion if we are being protected by God Almighty. This blessing is a restatement of an aspect of the first blessing that we saw in Revelation 1.3. 
Jesus said, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. In Luke 11, verse 28, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book and keep the words of the prophecy. Oh, we're just continuing on here. The angel tells us that the book of Revelation contains what? Prophecy. It is not a devotional work setting forth the ultimate victory of good over evil or general uh, spiritual principles. Neither is it to serve as a platform for all out uh, for out of balance sensationalism without application. So it's saying it, it, that's not its purpose. The purpose of revelation is to what? Give us a picture of what will take place. God does not command believers to read Revelation merely to satisfy their curiosity about the future. It's not so that we can get all of our timelines and everything just right, although that's not necessarily a bad thing, but that's not the purpose, okay? He did not inspire it to provide material for detailed chronological charts of end-time events, however those might be helpful, okay? God inspired Revelation for one purpose, to reveal the glory of His Son and to call believers to live godly, obedient lives in light of his soon return. The purpose of Revelation is not to provide entertainment, but to provide motivation for godly living. Isn't that what the whole Bible is for as well, friends? I'm reading through the Bible. At the beginning of this year, I started reading. I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tackle it. I'm gonna get through the Bible. Um, I'm, our, I'm ahead, so thank God for that. I've been driving a lot, so I get, I get to listen to it while I'm driving. But you know, as you just listen to all these stories, I'm just reminded as, you know, we did this, um, as we did that series through Genesis when I first got here, man, you just listen to these stories. They're all pointing to Jesus. They're all pointing to godly living, to giving us motivation, it's just giving us a snapshot of what happens when we turn our backs on God. In, in this final message, our Lord Jesus Christ, the living word of God, our Redeemer, tells us to honor the written word of God. We should sit up and listen very carefully, right? Why? Why? Because we're living in a day when men are attempting to get downgrade the written word or to set it aside in favor of the living word. In every phase of Jesus' ministry, he was careful to honor the written word and to submit himself to it, and so should we. How often do we see? Why am I saying this? Because we see this in, even in, in mainstream Christianity today, emphasizing their devotion and zeal for the Lord while holding on to faulty views of Scripture. You see, friends, when we're seeking after God, we follow him in word and in truth. This is an age-old recipe for disaster, as we see in Scripture, demonstrated by religious but unbelieving Israel at Jesus' first coming. They came to listen to Jesus, but they already had a reason for everything, didn't they? They already had the answer. They didn't really need Jesus. They just wanted to trap Jesus. Paul called it zeal without knowledge. Listen to what he says in Romans chapter 10, if you have your Bibles. I didn't get this one on here. Romans 10, 1-4. It's powerful. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be what? Saved. His desire for Israel was that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own what? their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Wow. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Does that make sense? Does that mean, oh, Jesus did away with the law when he came? No, it's saying that the righteousness of God does away with the law because why? The righteousness of God is the law. And they missed it. Jesus was right in front of them. He was working out his law. And that's why when they asked him, well, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your what? Neighbor is yourself. In these two hang all the law and the prophets. Why? Because that's what the command, he didn't, he didn't say, forget the other 10 or forget the 10 that I gave you before. He's saying it's summarized. That's what summarizes our commandments of the Old Testament. 
It seems that many, peop- uh, many believe God can be worshipped emotionally, but without truth. Are we seeing that today in Christianity? Sometimes, sometimes. This is a dangerous and deceptive ground, believing themselves to be exhibiting great devotion and offering true worship. They're focused on feelings, aren't they? They're in reality worshiping a God of their own creation and holding his word in relatively low esteem. Should we feel when we're in the presence of God? Yes, absolutely. Can we rely upon feelings for salvation? No, we rely upon the word of God for salvation. We rely upon the Jesus that we hear about in the Bible for salvation. So may we study the importance our Lord placed upon the scriptures and their reliability and then make it our own. It can't just be feelings, friends. Blessed are those who do his commandments. Revelation twenty two fourteen. this is the last one. Those who do are hoi poentes, uh, poentes, present tense participle, the ones continually doing. Blessed are those who wash their robes. Those are blessed who are washing their robes, what? Continually. You know, when you look at the original language, how could you ever believe in a once saved, always saved mentality? Jesus doesn't want us to point to a place in the past where we had an experience. Yes, we might be able to point to that place and say, that's what started me on the road. And I've been washing my robes in the blood of Jesus ever since. Praise God. This text is speaking of our sin being cleansed by the blood of Christ that we see throughout Revelation, but also for those who are born again and are doing the will of the Father. So yes, we have that cleansing, but it also propels us into what? Into doing. Cleansing, doing. Not everyone who says to me, this is what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who what? does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, that's not what we want to experience, is it? What we want to experience is that continually washing our robes in the blood of the lamb because in doing so it will keep us close to the blood of jesus friends and the blood of jesus is what has power to cleanse our blessing does not derive from merely knowing the things of god but from doing them it's found throughout scripture jesus said that if we love him then we will what keep his commandments absolutely When we neglect to keep his commandments, we demonstrate our lack of love for him. Our motivation to keep his commandments is also found in our desire for God to purify us in preparation for his coming. 1 John 3, 2 and 3. Let's look at that. 1 John 3, 2 and 3. We're almost done with the study this morning. 1 John 3, 2 and 3. Beloved, Now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but when we know that when he is revealed, we shall be what? Like him. For we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. See, the power to keep his commandments is derived from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit prompts us. If we call him Lord but do not keep his commandments, we are in effect schizophrenic, aren't we? Lord, Lord, but then we ignore the commandments. What does that mean? How can he be Lord when we do not obey him? Worse than that, we are found to be liars concerning our relationship with him, as we just um, read there in 1 John. If we keep his commandments, 
Oh, no, this, I'm sorry, this is a different verse. 1 John 2, 3, and 4. Now, by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And listen to what James says. Powerful. James 1, 21 to 24, it's right here on the screen. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man, observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of a man he is. Let's not deceive ourselves. Let's be honest when we look in the mirror. What do we see? Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life. They may have the right to the tree of, of life is estai e exousia auton epi. It will be the authority over them, over the tree of life. So they will have at their fingertips the tree of life. The right to the tree of life is universal to all believers who are saved by the blood of Jesus. And it says, may enter through the gates into the city. Those who are born again are the overcomers, just as Jesus met with Nicodemus that one night long ago. The need for us is to be born again. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, they will also be given, or sorry, they will also be those who do the commands of the Lord. They are among the redeemed who are written in the book of life and therefore avoid the second death, which is being cast into the lake of fire that we talked about earlier. They have full access to the new Jerusalem whose gates are never closed. All the redeemed have access through those gates. I won't take time to read it this morning, but Revelation 21, 24 to 27 is a great read. Um, you can enjoy that this afternoon. So this morning, as we have... Um, had a little overview about the blessings of the Lord. I want you to take away at least one thing with you, and that is to behold Jesus Christ. To behold Jesus Christ. This is reminded during Sabbath school of the, of the story in the Old Testament where the, the people have been bitten by snakes out in the desert, and they were terrified, didn't know what to do. People were dying. And um, God told them to, to, to make a, a bronze serpent and to hold it up. And the, the only requirement was to look and live. But what an unlikely place to look, to look at a snake. The snake is what bit me. Terrible. What a likely place to look. Jesus, the one who came, who spoke with authority, but yet was so, you know, weak and soft. He just, he mingled with all those sinners and those saints. What good could he do me? Friends, look and live. Behold Jesus, and you will be changed into his image. I want to sing a closing song with you this morning. And um, it's taken from Revelation 19.1. Do you know how to play this one? You don't know how to play this one. Okay. Excellent. I'm surprised. That's great. So um, may, should I sing it through without that? Should I sing it through once without the chords to make sure it's the same one? Sounds good. Yeah. Okay, good, good. All right. So now we'll work on the timing. But um, you know what? This might be a little comical. Let's have prayer right now. Lord, we're just so... Um, so blessed to be in your presence this morning, so blessed by your words here in Revelation. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you've outlined for us, even throughout this book that is sometimes a struggle to look at because we know it outlines such a terrible time in earth's history, but yet a merciful time in earth's history, a time where all of this pain and suffering and, and everything will be done away with because you are that rock that is cut out without hands, that comes to destroy this sin-sick world, but not in vain, but to build a kingdom 
that we desire to be a part of. And so, Lord, just keep us close to you. May we behold you every day. May we continually be washing our robes in your blood so that we may be with you soon in your kingdom that we call heaven. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Bless one each here. Amen. So um, just stand with me and I'll, I'll sing this through. Hopefully some of you know it. You can kind of hum along. It's pretty simple. It goes like this. Hallelujah, salvation and glory, honor and power unto the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God is wonderful. Hallelujah, salvation and glory, honor and power, He is wonderful. So the timing's a little tricky, isn't it? But you got the right, right chord, so thank you. All right, you gonna come sing with me? Okay, Tali's gonna come sing with me. She knows the song too. All right. <clears throat> All right, we'll try to sing loud. Hallelujah, salvation and glory, honor and power unto the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God is wonderful. Hallelujah, salvation and glory, honor and power, He is wonderful. Is that good for today? You want to do it one more time? One more time? <laughs> All right, so we're going to have to learn this one. We're going to be singing it every time I do a Revelation sermon. All right. Hallelujah, salvation and glory, honor and power unto the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God is wonderful. Hallelujah, salvation and glory, honor and power, He is wonderful. Yes, Lord, you deserve our praise because you are wonderful. You are powerful. You are omnipotent. You are the God of our salvation. So we praise you today, Lord. Go with us. Bless our families um, and those that are represented here. We thank you, Lord, for, for the blessings that you've given us. Um, whether they come through raindrops or tears, we know that one day you will conquer all. And so we look forward to that day, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.